Today we're going to be looking in chapter 9 here in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be looking at verse 30 through 37. And what I'll do is I'll begin reading here at verse 30, read to verse 32. As is my normal way of teaching, I'll give to you a reminder of what we've gone through. That helps us to be fresh for this section. It also helps those who perhaps were not with us last time to know where this, uh, where Jesus is um, moving and where Mark is recording and, and the events that relate to that. And so I'll give you a prolonged introduction as I normally do, build this up and then move in to the passage. So beginning at verse 30, reading to verse 32, Mark chapter 9, Mark writes, Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know it, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. As I've been sharing with you, Jesus has entered into his last six months of ministry with his disciples. At this point, he's spending less time with the multitudes and more time with his men. This is so he can give them further instruction concerning his kingdom and also have them prepared for his upcoming death. As we saw in our last study, Jesus delivered a young boy from demon possession. This demon had tortured the boy since he was very little, perhaps even from infancy. The boy's father had come to, to see Jesus, to, to ask him for help, but Jesus was not available. Jesus was on the Mount Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. And so because Jesus was not there, he went to the apostles, and he asked the apostles who had remained behind to help. Now Jesus came down from the mountain, and as he did so, there was a crowd that was a growing crowd and it was forming even as he was coming down the mountain. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 38, Luke tells us that a man from the crowd had cried out asking for his help. Matthew 17, verse 14 said, A man came to him, kneeling down to him, and begged for deliverance. This father was beside himself with grief and frustration. He had gone to Jesus' men and asked them to intervene on his behalf, but they had failed. And it's not that they didn't try. They had tried it's just that they tried and failed. They couldn't do it. And the failure on the part of Jesus' men had undermined his faith even more. This is where the, the man in Jesus' men had made a mistake. The man had put too much faith in, in Jesus' men, and the men put too much faith in themselves. You see, in the past, they had been empowered by Jesus to cast out demons, and they had. But this time, they failed. And now they need to learn a lesson. And the lesson is simple. Don't rely on past success. You need to be on the alert and prepared at all times. So Jesus had to give both the man and the apostles a lesson in faith. To the man, Jesus pointed out that all things are possible to him who believes. But to the men, Jesus pointed out that small faith in a great God can move mountains. So at this point, Jesus leaves the northern shore, the northern border area, and he begins to travel down south. Now he's doing this again. He wants to minister to his disciples without interruption. He had just given his men a lesson on faith. Now he has to give them a second, a lesson on humility. Now, I want to talk about humility for a moment, kind of lay a foundation. Humility is not necessarily a virtue that is valued by modern society. As a matter of fact, we don't honor humility. We actually, as a society, honor arrogance and pride. And we know that. Perhaps it just takes one or two illustrations to point that out. Uh, somebody scores a touchdown, and what's he do with the ball? Does he hand it to the ref and say, thank you very much, and walk? No, he does a dance. He slams a ball, and the crowd cheers. We are very much into into uh, rewarding pride and arrogance. We, we really are. And, uh, you know, uh, that humility is just not a virtue that people, that people request or, or even regard. Uh, in, a, in a world that values pride and personal greatness, humility is considered weakness. Now, this attitude of humility, this uh, appeal to pride began actually uh, in, in the garden. We see it in the garden where where Satan 
uh, told Eve, you know, that, that she could eat of the forbidden fruit because when she did so, she would be like God, knowing uh, good and evil. And also, we see this appeal to, to people to move in a direction that, that, that can amount to, in your own mind, greatness from really the beginning. And I was looking at this, and, and I wanted to see how is humility regarded in, in ancient culture. And, and one writer said this, he said, in ancient Greece, humility was unknown. Even in Greece, perhaps the most ethically aware of all ancient cultures, humility played no part in the good life. So humility was regarded as weakness. It was not regarded as a virtue. 18th century philosopher David Hume wrote, humility neither advances a man's fortune in the world nor renders him a more valuable member of society. Neither does it qualify him for the entertainment of company, nor increases his power of self-enjoyment. So humility may not be valued by fallen man, but it is foundational in the kingdom of God. And that's because humility rises from a willingness to see yourself as you really are. It's simply an accurate understanding of who we are and our place in the world. And for believers... It begins when we understand who we are and what God has done for us. This knowledge of who we are leads us to treat others with kindness and grace. Because when you realize what you are and what you've been, how can you not treat somebody with kindness? How can you not treat them with grace? And that's especially true when we're seeking to minister to someone who has failed, a fellow believer. Humility is a proper understanding of self, and that's truly necessary. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So a truly humble person is aware of who they themselves are, and that helps you to value other people. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. So as we see in a moment, the apostles battled with pride, so they needed to learn the lesson of humility. Verse 30 tells us that they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. Now, when you read your Bibles, and as we've been reading through Mark, but you can see this in the other Gospels, we see that Jesus ministered in this region for some time. He ministered there often, but now he's developing his men, and so he's, want, he's wanting to focus his attention on the things that they need to know. He's going to continue doing public ministry, but he's concentrating more intently on them because he's going to depart from them soon, and they have much to learn, and that especially relates to something he wants to teach to teach them. They especially must learn lessons that will form their character. And so he's about to teach them something about humility. Verse 31 says, he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. Now that's something that he has been emphasizing recently when he was up there in Caesarea Philippi, as we saw uh, before he had ministered there and he had told him he was going to be betrayed and and he had spoken to them concerning these things and at that time the apostle Peter well that just didn't sit well with him and that's why he said far be this thing uh, from you that it should happen to you and that's when the Lord Jesus had to rebuke him and and let him know no this is the foundation this is why I have come so he's already begun sharing with them concerning those things in chapter 9 here, at verse 12, he had said that the Son of Man uh, must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. So he's beginning to share with them in layers the things concerning him and how he's going to be treated. You see, this is what they need to have reinforced in their understanding. And this is something that's new to them. He has to reinforce in their understanding that the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant. He has to reinforce in them that the Messiah is one who's going to die. And that's something that was very new to them. They did not understand that the Messiah was to be sacrificed. You see, this wasn't something they'd been taught. This isn't something that the rabbis had, had, had taught them about uh, Messiah at all. So it, it bothered them. 
In 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul said it like this. He said, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. A stumbling block to Jews. You see, the general expectation concerning Messiah during the time of Jesus was simple. Before Messiah came, there'd be a time of terrible trouble and tribulation. Before Messiah arrived, there would be a forerunner, Elijah. And after these two events, Messiah would arrive and he would establish his kingdom. The thought of a suffering servant dying for them on a cross was foreign. And because of this, Jesus had to clearly emphasize that he was going to die. And so he had, a, he had to emphasize that with them. You see, in Luke 9, 44, he said, Let these words sink down into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Let this sink down. You've got to receive this. It has to go deep within you. And so with that in mind, he's preparing them for his betrayal and his death. What he has to say is of utmost importance, and he greatly desires them to understand it. The thought of him being betrayed and dying is something they don't want to hear. So as we've seen, some of the things that he was teaching them would be understood later. His suffering and his death was something they needed to understand at that time. So he begins to remind them. He reminds them of his upcoming death. He reminds them as what it was going to happen. And in doing so, he shares three basic things with them. Notice this in verse 31. First, he says, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. He's going to be betrayed. That is mind-boggling to them. They couldn't believe that he would be betrayed, and they had no idea who it would be who was going to do that. They didn't know. I mean, how would you, how would you, how would you even believe that, he was, that somebody would actually betray him? That, that word betray means to give up treacherously. It means to abandon. He's saying, I'm going to be betrayed into the hands of men. I'm going to be handed over for judgment and even punishment. And he knew it was Judas who's going to do it. Now, Judas is an interesting character. We'll see him more often as we go through the gospel and all. But when you look at Judas, out of all of the men, he was very trusted. How do we know that? He was the treasurer. He held the money bag. You don't give to someone you don't trust your funds. You just don't do that. Jesus gave to him the authority to handle the money bag. And so he was the treasurer. And when Jesus, even at the table, says, you know, one of you will be be uh, betray me uh, the men began to ask is it I is it I is it I they didn't even consider that it could be somebody else they, they said is it, is it me is it my heart am I what, am I going to do that and even Judas himself said is it I they didn't suspect Judas at all they didn't suspect him so when Jesus says he will be betrayed that's something hard for them to to, to get hold of but Judas was going to be the one who did it Jesus knew it in John 13, verses 18 and 19, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. He was speaking of Judas. So he is going to be betrayed. He's going to be given up treacherously and abandoned. Second, they will kill him. Now, as men struggled with the thought of this, that Jesus would be put to death by the Romans, the Jews, but this was something they would later see was necessary for their salvation. Paul, later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, writes, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And then he said he will rise the third day. This was something else that they did not understand yet, the centrality of his resurrection. You see, after he was resurrected, they would come to see what he meant. His resurrection is the center of our faith and the heart of our message. See, we preach a gospel that includes Jesus Christ dying on the cross. But that gospel, in order to be good news, includes the fact that he died but rose from the dead on the third day. And so Jesus Christ taught that. He taught his men to know that. And if, if Jesus died and remained in the grave, then, then all of his teachings that he gave up to that point are useless. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 17, Paul said it like this. He said, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. 
More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We preach the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified, but that he rose the third day from the dead. That's what we teach. That's what we believe. He said, we, if this is not so, later in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, he would say, we have, of all men are most miserable. Because the life that we're living is one of, of many times persecution and suffering. And, and we're going through all of this for what? For, for a, a, a man who lied? C.S. Lewis said it very well. He said, either Jesus Christ is, 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 is the Lord or he's a liar or a lunatic. If he's a, if he's, if he's a lunatic, he's going to be saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to be raised from the dead. You need to believe in me. I'm going to come back with my angels, and we're going to wipe out the earth and all of that. Now, only a lunatic would say that if it's not true. A liar, well, how can you call Jesus Christ a prophet or a good man or a good teacher if he's lying to you? Because good teachers and good men are not liars. So either he is the lunatic or he's, he's a liar or he's the Lord. Those are your three choices. And we as Christians... We believe that he actually was raised from the dead on the third day. And that's what he's teaching his men. But his men are not expecting that to take place. They don't understand, it says in verse 32. And they're afraid to ask him. They're not ready for, for what he has to say. And they, they're hesitating in asking a question. Now, Matthew and Luke give us greater insight into why they didn't understand. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 23, it says the disciples were filled with grief. In Luke 9, 45, it says they didn't understand what this meant. It was hidden. It was concealed from them. So they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. They have sorrow, hesitation to ask a question. But the sorrow and grief they have is understandable. He's saying, I'm going to die. And they love him. For, for them, the idea of him dying would cause them to be sad. But that sorrow is actually an expression of unbelief. In John 14, 28 and 29, he said, You heard me say I'm going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. And so he prepared them for this monumental thing called a resurrection. And so they're at that point, they're having difficulty and they're not really wanting to ask him. But once again, he lays a layer of understanding on them. After that, we move into verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum and asked, and, and rather, and when he was in the house, he asked them, uh, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? They kept silent. For on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, he called the 12, and slapped them around. No. <laughs> he, sa he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me but him who sent me so jesus is in capernaum and he's in a house now as we've been going through the gospels we've seen that he goes to this particular place called capernaum which is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in the north to a little to the west, that he had ministered out of Capernaum and uh, often, and several of his men actually lived there or were from around there. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and Matthew all lived in the city or near it. At this time, Jesus is more than likely once again in the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew because he had been there before. We saw that in Mark 1.29. What he's doing now is he's instructing them about humility. And he's going to do so by asking them a question. Notice verse 33. What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? 
What was it you were arguing about? Now, if you look at a map, Caesarea Philippi, which is the area, the region they're coming from, is to the north. And if they've taken a road and they're walking, it's about 50 to 60 miles for them to get there. During the day of Christ, you could walk up to 20 miles in a single day. So we're talking about a two and a half day, perhaps a three day journey. So on this two to three day journey, Jesus walking with the men, the men had gotten into an argument. Now they're trying to keep this to themselves, but Jesus is well aware of what was going on. And it makes me laugh when I was looking at this and preparing this. It makes me laugh to think of how we think we can keep things away from the Lord. In Psalm 139, verse 4, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You're aware. But they think they can hide this from him. So he asked, verse 33, what were you disputing about? That word disputing means debating or arguing. It speaks about a heated conversation. It wasn't a light conversation at all. They were getting angry and going at one another. But notice in verse 34, they, they kept silent, for on the road they disputed among themselves who's the greatest. Now, just a short while before, they were arguing loudly, but now they're strangely silent. Who's the greatest is the argument. That word greatest in the original language speaks of that which is a leader. It speaks of that which is larger. It speaks of the elder. Who is the greatest? Now, think about what's going on right now, and I want to develop this with you. Recently, Jesus was there in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And as we saw, Jesus asked the man, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And we see how the apostle Peter said, some say that you're John, Elijah, Jeremiah, you're one of the prophets, but who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, by joint of flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Simon, you have received spiritual revelation. How do you think Simon felt when he got that spiritual revelation? When he's speaking to Christ and Christ is commending him, he must have felt that he had somehow arrived in a certain place. Not only that, but Peter, James, and John had been just recently, they were on the Mount Transfiguration. The other nine had been at the foot of the Mount. They were on the top there with Jesus as he was transfigured before them. They saw the glory. They, they saw Elijah, they saw Moses. They, they partook in that. What do you think they thought about themselves as they're coming down? And we were just on the mountain. You guys can't even cast out a demon. That's kind of what's going on. And so now the boys are together and they're walking for two and a half, three days. And they're saying, <laughs> you know, you're, you're important. Who's to say you're not? You are. As a matter of fact, I personally think you're great. Not as great as me, but you're great. You keep trying. You know, do some spiritual calisthenics. You'll grow up. You'll be like me. The attitude, we say, is that possible? Why not? That's what they were doing. They were arguing. Uh, Peter, you're not that great. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Let me ask a question. You, re you remember that time I took a walk on water? Enough said. <laughs> how, how, can you say, how, how can you say that I'm not the greatest? How could you possibly say that? I walked on water while you sat in a boat. Let's not talk about it. I don't want to embarrass you. You all know it. That kind of attitude. You think the men could be that way? Why couldn't they? Why couldn't they? And the other, other guys, James and John. Yeah, we, we were up there. We, we actually uh, saw Elijah and Moses. You guys hear about them. <laughs> I can tell you what they look like, but I can't tell you. My lips are sealed. But anyway... Who do you think you are, says Lebeus? Who here knows anything about him? Lebeus. You've got three names. Because he does. Three, three different names describing one man. Who are you? Who do you think? Do you think that it's not possible? Of course we know that it is possible. Why? Because a human beings in need of a savior, just like we are. And when they have spiritual experiences... It could go to your head to the point where you are more than willing to argue about who is the greatest in the kingdom. Now, we all know that Jesus is, but I'm right next to him. And, you know, we know that later on, um, James and John's mom is going to come and ask for them to have 
positions of honor in the kingdom. And it's kind of one of those nepotistic kind of things because James and John are Jesus's cousins. So James and John can say, yeah, yeah, Peter, it's cool. But we're blood. Blood. Blood in, blood out. That's us. <laughs> right? We're blood. That does take place. And so Jesus has to teach them a lesson that people don't really want to learn. It's called the lesson of humility. These people had had Peter, James, John, even Andrew was part of some of those things. Uh, they had had special experiences that the others had not shared. And that would have given them opportunity to consider themselves the elders. And that didn't sit well with the other apostles. Now, it's telling how this comes after Jesus once again spoke of his betrayal and death. They should have been discussing that, not who's the greatest in the kingdom. Now, why would they be discussing that? Well, their belief was an immediate establishment of the kingdom. And since they thought it would happen quickly, their ambition, not affection, had been stirred. So in response, Jesus does not speak of the nature of greatness. He speaks of the road to it. So notice in verse 35, he sat down, he called the 12, he said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. He begins by referring to the desire to be first. Now, many a Christian and many a pastor has struggled with the desire for preeminence. And Jesus, speaking of the religious leaders of his day, said that they were guilty of desiring preeminence. He said that they do all their deeds to be noticed by people in Matthew 23, verse 5. And sadly, the need for attention can drive us to even serve expecting to be noticed. Sometimes those they are leading are willing to give them the attention that they're seeking. When you have a minister who serves for attention, there will always be people around him who will give him the reward of attention. It's one of those things that, especially when God uses you in, in a wonderful way, that can go to your head, and before you know it, you begin to think that it's because of you that these things are happening. And you'll always have somebody around you clapping for you, cheering for you, and telling you that you're the best. And if there's anything that we like to hear, it's, we like to hear things like that. It goes to your head. And nobody is totally invulnerable to those things. You have to die to those things. You have to be aware of those things. Sometimes in ministry, ministers will do things to be seen by men. I learned this. I started learning this before I was saved when I was about 16, maybe 17. We were having a day in our, in our PE class. We had, to, we had to go swimming. I'm no swimmer. So my friends and I were at the shallow end of the pool just kind of standing around talking. And I was, like I said, probably a junior or a senior at that time. And we we're just kind of talking amongst ourselves. We had to, you know, stay there the whole gym period. So we're visiting. And as we're talking, I heard a voice and I turned around. And on the other end of the pool is the high dive. And there's a freshman, a 14-year-old little boy, standing on the edge of the high dive at the board, on the board. And he was yelling. And that's what drew our attention because he was yelling, Coach, look at me. I'm going to jump. And as I looked at him, there's this little guy just standing on the edge. This little guy, 14 years old or so, and standing on the edge of the, of the board. And he's saying, look at me, coach, I'm going to jump. And I'm looking at him. And the coach is, is not noticing that he's doing that. So he keeps yelling. He kept yelling, coach, I'm going to jump. Watch me, I'm going to jump. And then finally, the coach turns and looks at him. He says, what? He says, I'm going to jump. And then he jumps. And so... I, I, I'm, I'm a 16, 17-year-old kid, and we don't have a whole lot of mercy in our hearts at that age. And, and I'm thinking, hey, what's with this guy? I mean, what do you need to be noticed? You're jumping off a board. I'm jumping off a board. Okay, shut up. You know, that's where my heart was. But later on, the Lord taught me something I haven't forgotten ever. And it's been a long time ago that he began to teach me, and that was simply this. Some, some people need attention because they don't get it anywhere else. He may not have had a, a dad in the home. 
He may have been, you know, ignored. There could have been a thousand and one reasons why this little guy needed the attention of someone he thought was important. So the Lord began to speak to my heart about that. And he said, you know, you have to have kindness to those who, who have been without. But you also have to be careful because within you is, is also the seed of the desire to be noticed for the things that you do. So die to that. Don't boast about yourself. Don't boast about your accomplishments. Don't try and impress people. Just serve me because that's the lesson of humility. To give God all the glory and all the credit. You see, when we begin to exalt re religious leaders and begin to treat them like royalty, it, what it does is it exalts in them pride and it extinguishes humility. They thought that they were hiding this from Jesus, but Jesus was aware of their hearts. Luke 9.47 says that Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and set him by him. Perceiving the thought of their heart, he saw it. And he needed to give them a lesson on humility. He wanted them to know that greatness in his kingdom begins with a heart of service. All of us have a desire to be known. And I'm not saying that it's wrong for us to have a natural desire to have friends and those who love us and even those who encourage us. I just believe that we have to be very careful that we don't do things to be seen by man and rewarded through their attention. Because Jesus taught us it's wrong. He says, you don't give to be seen, you'll get your reward. You don't pray to be seen, you'll get your reward. You don't fast to be seen, you'll get your reward from men. Do these things in secret, God will reward you openly. He taught us those things. But all of us want people to know who we are. And so that's, that can be a very destructive thing in the ministry, and especially in the heart of a pastor. It wasn't that long ago I was invited to, to, to a local um, prayer meeting. It was a, it was a marriage prayer, uh, breakfast prayer meeting. They had asked me if I would close the meeting in prayer. And so I'm sitting there and there's several pastors and, and the first pastor, Jack Hibbs, Jack got up and he prayed a beautiful prayer. And Mary Uloa got up and said, Ooh, who can talk after Jack Hibbs? And so, you know, everybody cheered because of that and all of that. And I'm just kind of sitting there and then all these other guys, we now have pastor so-and-so, pastor so-and-so. And finally, I come up at the end to pray. And the guy introducing the people praying looks at me and says, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. So I hit him. No, and so he, <laughs> you'll remember, remember, David, David, David. No, I, he, <laughs> I started, you know, like, what are you going to do? Do you go up to be known or do you go up to exalt the Lord? The Lord has been teaching me this for so many years, and I'm so I'm really kind of used to it. I'm really kind of, I am used to it, as a matter of fact. And you know what? It's a good place to be, to know that the one who knows your name is Jesus Christ, and it doesn't matter if anybody else does, is a good lesson to have. It really matters. It really does. And I say that, I say that sincerely. In Matthew 10, 24 and 25, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It's enough for the disciple that he be as his master, the servant as his Lord. In Luke 22, 27, who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. Greatness in the kingdom of God has a different standard. The measure of a man is not how many servants he has, but how many men he serves. And his men needed to learn to put others and their needs before their own. In Romans 12, 10, it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. The men needed to learn the lesson of humility. God opposes the proud. In Luke 14, 7 through 11, he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled 
and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Learn the lesson of humility. And that's the lesson they need to learn. And so how is he going to emphasize this? Verse 36, he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So this child is not named, notice that, but commentators have speculated it may have been one of the Apostle Peter's kids. Now, this is a little child. Notice he uses the phrase little child. That speaks of a toddler. The word can also be used to describe an infant. And what you have a picture of is Jesus tenderly scooping up a small child and holding him in his arms. Now, why would he be a model of humility? Well, a small child has yet to have accomplished anything that would be noteworthy. They have no actual power. They haven't achieved anything in the world. They're small, they're weak, they're dependent, they require constant care and protection. At that time, they weren't even taught the law until they were 12 years of age. The rabbis considered it a waste of time to try and teach them until they were older. But Jesus took the child up in his arms, and he used the child as an example to his men. Notice what he says in verse 37, he who receives one of these little children in my name receives me. As he's holding him, he's teaching his disciples a lesson. When we are sent out with the message of the gospel, we are representing him to the world. The non-believing world can have different reactions to our message as well as to us. Those who aren't believers can reject the gospel and reject those who are bringing it. Mark 6, 11 says, whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. They can reject you. Even friends and family may reject us because we love the Lord. Again, that's part of the cost of being a disciple. In Matthew 10, 34 through 36, do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. See, ladies? <laughs> and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. But there are others who embrace the message of the gospel. And in doing so, they're embracing not only us, but the one who sent us. In Matthew 10, 40, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, Matthew gives us more insight, Matthew 18, verse 3, when he says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at that for a minute. The key to entering the kingdom of heaven is to humble yourself. The word humble, again, speaks of making yourself low. To be converted requires one to be willing to be humbled and become like a little child. In James 4, 6, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So in what way can I look at a little child and learn spiritual lessons? Well, one... Little children are very trusting. If you make them a promise, they will hold you to it because they know that you said. They know. Daddy, you said. Daddy, you said. Yeah, 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 I did. No, Daddy, you said. They know. They, I've heard how many times have I heard that? Daddy, you said. I know, I know. Well, they're trusting. They, they, they know that, that you said it, so you're going to do it. Has he said it, and shall he not do it? If God says you shall be born again when you believe in me and you will enter into the kingdom of heaven, has he said it, and will he not do it? How can I be saved by trusting him and taking him at his word? Another thing about little children is they believe that in, in, for me as a son to a father, that their father can do anything. I thought my dad 
could do anything. I remember, let me give you an ancient history lesson. I'll take a moment. When Disneyland opened up here in California, I was five years old when it opened up. I wanted to go to Disneyland with my brother. I didn't care if he went. I wanted to go to Disneyland with all my heart. And they used to have a program, Disney, Disneyland program, all kinds of things. My dad knew it. And now we're aware there's such a place as Disneyland. Well, one day my dad says to us, kids, on Saturday I've got a surprise for you. So we didn't know. He didn't tell us what it was. Saturday came. They got us dressed up. I remember being put in the car as we're sitting there. It's pouring rain, poured rain. But my dad's going to do something because he told me, and I know it's going to be special because he made a promise and he'll keep his word. That's how I thought as a five-year-old. We couldn't go to Disneyland. We didn't know it was closed. We didn't know that's where we were going. So instead, we went up into the Venice area where my family lived, and off we go to Venice, and, and we pulled into this little hamburger place that used to be there, and he bought us hamburgers, and we thought, man, we're living big, a hamburger, and we got a surprise. And so I still remember showing up in front of my aunt's house, climbing out, and it started to snow. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you for making it snow. I thought my dad made it snow. I really did. My brother and I are just jumping around, picking up. Daddy made it. So thank you for your surprise, Daddy. It's the greatest. Dis and my dad never told us, I didn't make it. No, my dad just, my lying father took glory. <laughs> your father can do anything. One time my dad told me, go get a tool. It's in the garage. And I climbed over a fence. No, actually, I went down the side and went up the driveway to go in the garage. And when I got to the garage, my dad was already in the garage. And I looked at him, and I said, how'd you get here? How'd you get here? I flew, my dad told me. I flew over the house, son. I was in a hurry. I believed he flew over the house. Why not? Because my dad had told me he's Superman, and Superman flies. Made sense to me. And so my father could do anything. Well, obviously, my daddy couldn't, but my father in heaven can. And so if he has said it, shall he not do it? Is he not powerful enough to make it come to pass? That's how children think. Babies are also very loving and very dependent. They're just the sweetest little things, and they just, they just care uh, I've had the joy of having my son, Joseph, and my daughter-in-law, Karina, live with us. Um, she conceived just prior to moving in, so she was pregnant. She moved into our house, and they had sold their home, and they were going to be purchasing another one. And, and they said, can we live with you for a month or two? Well, they're still there. And, um, <laughs> and, and my granddaughter is six months old, going on seven months. So that tells you how long they've been living without paying rent. And so... <laughs> so we've had the joy of revisiting small children because my granddaughter, Olivia, is three and my other grandbaby is six months, going on seven months, my Nora. And so we've had the joy of revisiting babyhood by having them with us. And one of the things, you know, how loving my Olivia is, is one of the things is Marie and I will be sitting down on the couch and every night it's a ritual, her dad brings her down and brings her to us, and he'll say, which one's it going to be? But before she comes, she'll be yelling, here comes somebody. And so I yell out, here comes somebody, here comes somebody, like the queen is arriving, and she'll come in, and then she'll look at us, and he swings around, and he'll say, who do you want to kiss first? Who do you want to kiss first? And he'll do that. She always kisses mom, grandma, and uh, that's why I kicked Marie out of the house for a few days. <laughs> She always kisses Grammy first, and then she kisses Papa. It's our ritual, and, and, and it's become very beautiful for us. It's been a sweet time to have that. And, and my Nora, whenever she sees us, she kicks her little feet and smiles. They're so loving, and, and, there's, and we're supposed to be too, aren't we? How can, what are we to be as, as Christians? They shall know you're my, my disciples if you have love, love for one another. Love is the birthmark of the believer. What are you to be like? We're to be loving. 
They're also very simple. They don't require long answers. They don't. A little boy says to his daddy, Daddy, where do I come from? And daddy's driving and mama's sitting next and she looks at him. She says, you got to answer that one. I'm not going to. Where did I come from? Well, son, um, kid's only eight years old. How do I explain? <sighs> you know, when you like women and you get married and, and you, you kiss them and you hold them, sometimes, <clears throat> why do you want to know? <laughs> he says, I, I don't know. He says, you know, my friend comes from Ontario and I was just wondering where I come from. <laughs> you know, they require, <laughs> they, they require innocent responses. They don't need long answers. And they are also very dependent. They rely completely on their caretaker. Is that not what we're supposed to do? And then finally, this is something I've discovered, perhaps it may be just unique to my experience, they never resist a gift. They don't resist gifts. As a matter of fact, they expect more. But they never respect, they never reject one. I've never seen them reject it. Oh no, Father, please give that to my brother. No, they don't do that. They take it, and is there anything else? God is offering us a gift. God is offering us a gift. Be like a little child. Don't reject it. He's offering it to you. Little children don't reject a gift. And finally, we are to be trusting him because Jesus is holding a toddler as he's given the teaching. And we're to be as trusting of him as this little child is resting in his arms. Deuteronomy 30 verse 20, love the Lord your God, obey his voice, cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days. Cling to him, hold fast to him, why he is your life. He is our life and he prolongs our days ultimately as we enter into eternity with him. So the humble, the peaceful, and dependent relationship keeps us secure as we serve him. Have faith, but also have humility. Father, we ask that you would work with